So clearly Jesus here is letting it out. He's, and he says that his heart is breaking. My heart is ready to break with grief. And he says that to them. He doesn't say it to his father, he says it to the people he's with, the people he can trust. And uh, all he asks of them is not to get him on the first boat out or to uh, solve the problem. He doesn't even ask for any consolation from them except one thing, which is what? Stay awake. Just stay awake with me. Uh, just be with me. Pay attention with me. He's not even saying to me, it's with me. It's that quality of companionship of that uh, makes all the difference between sometimes between how we survive uh, ordeals. So uh, he asked, asked them in this desperate state to stay awake with him. He goes away a little, a few feet away, he falls on his face in prayer, in prostration. And uh, it's, a, it's an image of complete uh, surrender, really. It's not just kneeling in a nice posture, this is a prostration, uh, which is a symbol of what? Complete abandonment, really. And he's on the ground. Very important image here in the story is the groundedness of Jesus. And uh, then he prays, uh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. Drinking the cup is the image of having to accept his destiny. And drinking the cup to the dregs, we often feel that when you're going through a difficult time and uh, you feel you've had enough, but no, there's a bit more, it's like drinking medicine that you don't like the taste of and you're told, no, no, you've got to finish it, finish it all. So you have to drain the cup to its dregs. But not as I will, but as you will. Much of this uh, account of the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane is, a, is, is an illustration of the Lord's Prayer, of the Our Father. In fact, I think if you, if you went through it carefully, the, the verses of the Our Father, you would see them illustrated in uh, all of them illustrated in this account of his last prayer in Gethsemane. And what is the prayer here of the Our Father? It's obviously, Thy will be done. What, what other prayer ultimately is there? Uh, it, it's natural and human to say, I would rather not have to go through this, please. But it is also deeply human if we are in touch with our deepest humanity, uh, to be able to say, but it is not my will that is at the center of this. So here's the first phase of his prayer. There are three phases. He prays three times in the story. So there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a process here. It doesn't all happen in one moment just as our own meditation doesn't just happen once. So he comes to the disciples and finds them asleep. And he says to Peter, he always picks on Peter, uh, but Peter's the one who, who takes the rap, uh, but they're all asleep. And he says, could you not stay, could none of you stay awake with me? Peter is the leader. Could you none of you stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may be spared the test. Also reminding us of the verse in the Our Father, that lead us not into temptation, also translated as do not put us to the test. A lot of discussion about what the test means. Maybe you'd like to take that as a topic for the uh, discussion. 
What does it mean to be not led into temptation? <clears throat> Although we know that temptation is the best way to, to get into good spiritual condition. Uh, but as the fathers used to say, if you're not struggling, uh, you're not growing. So you've got to have something to, to work with. Uh, so what does he mean by the test? Why should we pray to be spared uh, the test? Uh, and then his, his famous statement, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. How do we deal with this dichotomy? We all know that um, we, we, we like to commit ourselves to certain ideals or certain practices, and yet, in practice, day by day, we find that we fail. We fail to control our anger. We fail to be turned openly towards others when they are in need. We fail to keep certain physical or spiritual disciplines that we, that we know are good for us and that we should be doing. We fail. And if we're not aware of that failure, uh, we are in a worse condition, really, because we, we lack self-knowledge, humility. Um, but on the other hand, if we don't fail, there's an even bigger danger. bigger danger is, is if we keep all our good resolutions, we begin to feel a little self-satisfied. We begin to feel we're better than other people. And uh, we feel we've kept all the rules, we've mastered our self-discipline, uh, but we can easily then box ourselves into a, a very uh, sterile state of, of uh, spiritual or psychological um, self-sufficiency. So in some strange way, uh, failure is, is a part of our success part of our growing into the love of God. If it were not for failure, we would be really insufferable prigs and or hypocrites. So there's the paradox here that we live with. Like all paradoxes, you don't solve it. You just uh, live with it and hold yourself in this sort of vortex of uh, of energy in which contradictions uh, become uh, integrated in, in some unexpected way. So then he goes again a uh, second time to pray and it's the same prayer. If it's not possible, if it is not possible for this cup to pass me by, thy will be done. He comes again back to them and finds them asleep. And then he goes away again. Uh, the, the, he found them asleep because their eyes were heavy. So why are they sleeping? They didn't want to sleep. They wanted to stay awake. But their eyes were heavy. Is it just physical tiredness? Probably much more than physical tiredness because they must have been pretty, their adrenaline must have been flowing pretty fast uh, on this last night. So it wasn't just they were tired, it was escape, isn't it? Often, you know, especially in adolescence, you, you know, when life gets too much for you, you go to your bedroom and go to sleep, sleep for another 12 hours. Uh, but there are different kinds of sleep. There's the sleep of uh, where you voluntarily shut down. That's what sleep is, isn't it? It's kind of a shutting down, escape from the world. Uh, too much sleep makes us feel more tired. We're not refreshed. We have to find just the right number of hours that we need to 
wake up in the morning and feel very awake. If you, if you sleep just in order to escape, more than the body needs or the mind needs, then you, you feel more lethargic than you did before. So the sleep here, I think, is not just uh, physical tiredness. It's about the, the, the degree to which we can face reality and face it with our eyes open. And their capacity, like ours, is not very great. So he goes away and prays a third time using the same words as before. So, uh, Father John used to uh, sometimes quote that verse as uh, an illustration of repetitive prayer. Um, what is Jesus doing here? He's not trying to change God's mind. Uh, he's not informing God of anything God doesn't know. But he is repeating until the job is done, until the, the inner work has, has been done, he's repeating his mantra. He's, the Our Father is a kind of a mantra itself, and has been used as a mantra by many people who've discovered meditation in this way, people like Simon Bay. Uh, so he's, he's repeating uh, a single phrase almost, or a single truth, um, until the, the, the faithful act of repetition, the going back to his prayer, as we go back to our meditation, has uh, released or healed or integrated what needs to be done at that level. And uh, then he comes back again and wakes them up and will let them go back to sleep again. He says, the hour has come. It's that urgency in his tone of voice here, which uh, re is reflected uh, everywhere in his teaching, really. Uh, he begins his public ministry with the statement that the, the time has come. The kingdom of heaven is close at hand. The hour has come. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is upon you. So that's the urgency of any spiritual teacher, saying, now, it's now. This moment is where you have to change. So you don't do a five-year plan or try to get as much time uh, for yourself as possible before you start the work. Uh, the, the, the word of the, of the true teacher is now, is the day of salvation. This is the moment to start. You know, when should I start meditating? Should I wait till after the holidays? Or wait till I'm back at work? Or wait till my retirement? Or wait till I've left school? Or you know, wait till my life has sorted itself out a little bit more? If that ever happens. You know, when do I start? Well, now. The hour has come. Um, and then... Uh, the events start, the, the soldiers arrive, uh, Judas kisses him, identifies him with a kiss, betrays him with a kiss, and the, uh, the wheel is uh, now spinning. So, what do the disciples do? Well, the disciples run away. They weren't prepared to face the music, to stay beside him, in his need. They had avoided the, the moment of testing in Gethsemane and so they were unable to face the challenge uh, that, that happened immediately after Gethsemane. And this often happens in our life. We realize that we missed an opportunity. That it was all there for us all offered and we didn't take it we wanted to pick and choose and by picking and choosing you 
you don't know what to pick and choose because we only will ever pick the nice bits but you have to take the whole bit, the whole meal and uh, that's a terrible moment uh, and Peter uh, weeps bitterly the disciples clearly, as we'll see in later stories uh, suffer greatly for their feeling of failure and betrayal and we shouldn't underestimate that, this is not a pretty story and they pl are plunged into grief similar to the different kind of grief that Jesus was in and um, but the good news is and this is the good news that even though we blew it, we missed the opportunity, we failed, we are not rejected. We are still accepted. That's what the whole of the story is really about. But we haven't got there yet. You have to, you've got to go through the karma of your, of your failure before you can transcend the karma through grace. So that's the, that's the story of Gethsemane. And it's uh, pretty much the same story that we find in, in Mark, except he, he adds one interesting phrase when Jesus comes back to wake them up the second time. Uh, and he says, uh, Mark says, they did not know how to answer him. Very real sort of picture, they're sort of caught in the act and there's nothing they can say. They don't know how to answer him. Um, and it, it's very clear from this encounter between Jesus and the disciples that he's a dangerous person to know. He's not someone you can tame, as we were saying yesterday. You can't domesticate him. And, of course, we always want to set limits to the risk that we accept in any relationship. We want to protect ourselves, have an insurance policy. But in relationship to him, uh, the risk is 100%. And uh, we can't set limits to the uh, consequences of our relationship to him. And in Luke, uh, it's the same story, a shorter version, but with one added little detail, which uh, is significant. Uh, Luke adds this sentence. I can find it. Which <coughs> I can't. Um, and now there appeared to him an angel from heaven bringing him strength and in anguish of spirit he prayed the more urgently and his sweat was like clots of blood falling to the ground that's that detail of sweating blood uh, but it's interesting the angel uh, Luke likes angels. He brings angels into the stories quite often. Symbolizing what? Symbolizing the fact that even in the worst moments of our lives, there is usually, often, a, um, a source of consolation or of strength. Not just of consolation, but actually of strength. The angel is there to not sort of whisk you away on, on a white horse, and save you from it, but to strengthen you as you go through it. And I mean, here it's quite clear because the angel from heaven brings him strength. Doesn't say how. I think in that card I used to get every six times a year, uh, the angel was holding a cup that Jesus was drinking from. But anyway, uh, he gives him strength, and then in anguish of spirit, he prays the more urgently. 
So the strength is given to you to go through uh, even further, even deeper into the process. Now, just briefly, how does this relate to um, the Buddha? Well, the night before the Buddha was enlightened, he sat under a Bodhi tree in Bodhgaya, India. And there are different versions of the story, uh, different legends, different traditions, just as there are slight variations in the story of Gethsemane. Um, in one version, he makes a vow to Nirvana and to the earth uh, that he's going to sit there and get to the root of suffering or he'll die in the, in the attempt. Um, and again, there is this element of earthiness, of groundedness, at the moment after the Enlightenment, where he, uh, he, he calls upon the earth to be his witness, and he touches the earth. So many pictures of the Buddha showing him touch the earth. Uh, and the, the earth witnesses to his... Um, to his enlightenment. And uh, in, 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 the, in other versions, uh, he sits there through the uh, night uh, in a night of, of great suffering, uh, tortured really almost by Mara, the god of illusion, the destroyer, uh, and tempted and pushed and pulled, and like the temptation of St. Anthony in the desert. And uh, it, as he penetrates through this ordeal, he discovers his past lives in the first watch of the night. In the second watch, he discovers the law of karma, the law of cause and effect. And in the third watch of the night, he discovers the Four Noble Truths. And then one text, it says, Released, I discovered, that birth is ended, the holy life fulfilled, the task is done. There is nothing further for the world. The two stories are, provide very interesting comparisons. There is an ordeal that, we, that each has to go through in order to find release. Um, but there are also big differences in the two stories. Different contexts, different meanings. As the Dalai Lama says, the differences are just as important as the similarities. Um, but that might also be a topic uh, for discussion in the small, in the small groups. Um, as I say, the, the common ground is there, and it's the earth, it's nature. This is human nature. What Jesus goes through is what we go through in our own way. And the fact that we can see him going through it <coughs> changes the way we go through it. Maybe that is the source of our strength to be able to go through it, that we can see how he went through it. Um, the Buddha sat on the ground, Jesus prostrated on the ground, knelt on the ground. But the common ground is also there in the inner struggle, the struggle with the demons within us. The, struggle, the common ground is also there in the enlightenment that comes, the breakthrough that comes, uh, if we stay with it, go through the night. St. John of the Cross calls the night of the dark night. We go through that dark night and we actually discover that the darkness is, is light. And the, the common ground is also there in the fact that this experience is not just an individual one because the ego has been burst, has been transcended through Gethsemane. And when Jesus gets up from this ordeal and goes to meet his destiny. Uh, he does so in a very different mood from when he was sitting on the ground, his heart breaking, alone and isolated uh, with his sleepy disciples. He now is seen to be, as it were, in control of the situation almost. He's centered anyway. And 
he's fully in harmony with the events, terrible as they are, that are unfolding. So he's, he, is, he has really transcended the fear of death. Uh, he's not immune to pain or suffering, maybe not immune even to fear, but he is no longer controlled by him. And that's one of the fruits of this degree of enlightenment that he clearly uh, experienced in Gethsemane. Good. So, um, we'll break, have a little break now for uh, some refreshment and then um, strengthen us. And uh, then we'll divide into some small groups, maybe a couple in this room, a couple in here, a couple outside. And maybe divide into a group of five or so, five or six, and then maybe six, small groups of six, and try to mix yourselves up. Uh, so you don't have all the Buddhists sitting in one group and uh, all the islanders sitting in another group so try and uh, mingle and uh, the topics I would suggest would be uh, maybe this comparison between the the, the, the Bodhi tree and, the, and Gethsemane um, the um, I think some others uh, to give you later there's one strange verse in the Gospel of Luke, I think it's Luke or Mark, that is, um, nobody has ever explained. And it seems, um, so if you wanted to be, if you wanted to be, it only occurs in Mark, it just seems to be there for no reason, uh, but it's a graphic detail after, after the disciples all deserted him and ran away among those following was a young man with nothing on but a linen cloth they tried to seize him but he slipped out of the linen cloth and ran away naked so if you solve all the other uh, exegetical questions of the story you can explain that one <laughs> Okay, and uh, we'll meet again this evening.